So again, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Bon après-midi, bonjour. Uh, welcome to ESSEC and Sergi. Myself, I'm, I'm going to mix English and French. Uh, maybe everyone can feel at ease. Uh, I'm Sylvie Menissier and I'm the academic director for the master, we call it SMIB, Strategy and Management of International Business. Uh, this program is already run for 18 years now on our three campuses here in Sergi, as well as in Singapore for initial training for, let's say, young students, and also on our La Défense campus on, on the, the executive format for people uh, working, being already in the professional context. So, well, this afternoon I'm going to share with you very brief elements about the SMIP program because you might know some things. You can still come to us and ask questions uh, afterwards. And you have the website, you have the students, so you have all kinds of means to, uh, uh, to discover about the program. I'm just going to give you an overview and then I'll, I'll pass on the floor to uh, Nicolas, who's teaching uh, the strategy, the core strategy course within the program in, here in Sergi. So he will share with you a few uh, thoughts about uh, how we build strategy and how we learn to build strategy here at ESSEC. Um, je fais une petit, petite transition en français, donc juste pour vous rappeler le, le contexte, ou vous faire partager le contexte dans lequel on, on a créé ce, ce programme euh, il y a 18 ans. Euh, maintenant, on est en, en plein dans ce contexte, donc dans une notion de, de globalisation euh, des échanges et de ce qu'on peut appeler le business euh, au niveau mondial. Une concurrence internationale qui est clairement décisive, qui est accrue sur toutes les zones du monde avec des tonalités différentes, mais en tout cas une concurrence très très forte. Des marchés intérieurs, en tout cas sous nos latitudes européennes, qui sont en phase de maturité. Donc il faut aller chercher de la croissance, du développement de façon différente de la façon dont on le faisait par le passé. Et puis une notion de risk management qui est croissante dans nos environnements, c'est-à-dire on essaie euh, d'anticiper les, les risques, de les maîtriser, même si est, on est dans un univers mouvant où ce n'est pas facile, il faut être adaptable, agile. En tout cas, on, on travaille, nous, à l'ESSEC et avec nos étudiants dans cette, dans cette logique et dans cette perspective. Donc ça, ce sont les défis auxquels euh, les entreprises et, et aussi le secteur euh, non-business, puisqu'on forme aussi des personnes qui vont aller plutôt dans des organisations internationales. En tout cas, ce contexte, il est le même pour tout le monde. Et c'est dans ce contexte euh, qu'on doit former euh, nos étudiants nos participants pour qu'ils soient opérationnels dans leur avenir professionnel. Ce programme, euh, je vous le verrai en, en voyant un peu les différents euh, sujets qu'on aborde, c'est un programme qui est très ouvert, qui est très généraliste, qui touche à, à beaucoup de notions euh, du management et du business, euh, qui permet de former nos étudiants et nos participants euh, à des fonctions de top management euh, par la suite et à un, en, un environnement international compétitif et euh, évolutif et qui soit donc complètement adaptable à l'international. Et l'international, ça veut dire bah, le monde entier, c'est-à-dire pour des Asiatiques de savoir travailler travailler en Europe avec des Occidentaux, avec des gens de l'Amérique latine. Enfin voilà, on, on mixe un peu toutes les, toutes les cultures et toutes les approches euh, pour ce faire. Les objectifs euh, pédagogiques de, de ce programme donc c'est de préparer euh, nos étudiants à la capacité de concevoir et de formuler des stratégies euh, de développement qui soient pertinentes et les plus pérennes possibles de comprendre et de maîtriser tous les risques qui sont inhérents au contexte international quel qu'il soit et à un environnement qui est de plus en plus mouvant, de développer des compétences et maîtriser des savoir-faire propres au développement international, donc tout ce qui est lié à la stratégie mais aussi à l'ingénierie financière sur laquelle on passe pas mal de temps, vous le verrez, et puis sur l'aspect plus soft skills, d'être sur des notions de savoir-être, de dimension interculturelle, de lobbying, de competitive intelligence, donc tout un bagage, toute une, une boîte à outils qui permet de, de mieux appréhender l'univers dans lequel vous vous déployez et de mieux le, euh, le maîtriser. On travaille aussi beaucoup en géopolitique sur les différentes régions du monde pour permettre d'avoir un, une, une vision la plus transversale possible. Alors les grands 
piliers du programme, euh, deux sont inclus dans son titre, donc Strategy and Management of International Business, et bien sûr la stratégie, et Nicolas participera ou alimentera votre réflexion sur le sujet, c'est tous les sujets de management à l'international, tout ce qui est lié à ce qu'on appelle le International Business, donc les, les, le déploiement des affaires, le International Trade, les affaires internationales et les grands projets à l'international. Un, un bagage euh, plus que conséquent en, en finance, puisqu'on va vraiment, euh, c'est un programme qui a inclut à peu près un tiers de, euh, de son temps et de ses cours autour de, des notions financières. Donc on reprend, on prend les choses à la base sur le, la, la comptabilité financière et on va développer tout ce qui est notion de corporate finance, aussi les marchés financiers en termes de placement et toute l'ingénierie financière qui, est, qui va avec et, et sa logique à l'international. Donc ce sont des domaines où certains de nos étudiants euh, s'éclatent, d'autres euh, souffrent, euh, tout le monde en, en ressort vivant, mais en tout cas c'est euh, une notion qui est fondamentale, je ne pense pas que Nicolas me démentera, pour bâtir une stratégie, pour comprendre un environnement, on doit aujourd'hui maîtriser euh, les grands concepts de la finance, les grands équilibres financiers, même si on se destine bien évidemment pas tous à faire des carrières dans la finance. Euh, tout l'aspect marketing et son application à, à l'international, donc les fondamentaux et le déploiement de stratégies marketing à l'international. Et puis des aspects tout au long de, de la scolarité à l'ESSEC, un accompagnement et particulièrement sur les masters spécialisés qui sont des, des programmes éminemment professionnalisants, tout un accompagnement pour développer votre projet professionnel, pour le mettre en place, pour le réfléchir et pour vous doter des outils euh, pour euh, atteindre votre objectif professionnel, donc euh, un recrutement à la sortie du programme et puis tous les aspects de mise en réseau au travers de nos différents programmes, différents campus, le corps professoral, les intervenants, les anciens de ce programme et de l'ESSEC en général qui permettent de développer votre réseau professionnel qui est aujourd'hui un facteur clé pour une carrière. Alors les principaux thèmes développés, je ne vais, vais pas les passer en revue dans le détail, mais vous voyez sur la stratégie, on va partir très en amont sur tout ce qui est lié à, à l'environnement euh, économique et politique, à tout ce toutes les notions d'économique intelligence et de web intelligence. Avant de concevoir une stratégie, il faut maîtriser euh, ce, qui se, ce qui se passe au niveau du contexte, tout ce qui est lié à l'évaluation et, et à la maîtrise des risques, euh, tous les points liés à la, à la géopolitique, à l'analyse stratégique et les outils d'analyse stratégique tout ce qui est lié aux stratégies de développement à l'international, fusion, acquisition notamment, et lobbying à différents niveaux. Le management, on passe aussi pas mal de temps sur différentes notions, du, des fondamentaux du management à leur application dans le domaine entrepreneurial, à l'international, tout ce qui est lié au project management, les, les organisations, la façon dont les organisations aujourd'hui évoluent, le management de crise, etc., etc. Tout ce qui est lié au marketing, donc les fondamentaux, leur application à l'international, le marketing B2B, le marketing des services, un focus sur tout ce qui est lié au marché de, haute, de services et de produits de haute technologie, qui est un marketing un peu particulier, le marketing achat. Bonjour. Les affaires internationales, donc international trade, euh, tout ce qui est lié aux appels d'offres euh, internationaux, euh, le trading euh, et les marchés à terme sur les, les marchés stratégiques au niveau mondial, donc les matières premières par exemple et, et l'énergie, l'eau, qui sont des grands enjeux internationaux. Un cours axé sur l'élaboration euh, des prix à l'international, l'ingénierie juridique des contrats, donc euh, un bagage juridique aussi inclus dans le programme. Les notions de global sourcing, donc de, de politique achat euh, à l'international et de logistique et de supply chain. Et puis, euh, last but not least, euh, l'ingénierie financière, donc à nouveau les notions de comptabilité analytique, contrôle de gestion, analyse financière, financement euh, des, des courants d'affaires de, et des opérations ponctuelles ou pérennes, financement des projets, notamment des grands projets internationaux. Toute la notion de M&A, donc fusion-acquisition, garantie de paiement, les garanties de financement, la couverture des risques, etc. Donc euh, un bagage en finance et trésorerie internationale, un bagage en finance non, non négligeable. 
Je terminerai par quelques chiffres clés sur, sur le programme avant de passer la, la parole à, à Nicolas. Donc, je le disais tout à l'heure, c'est un programme sur lequel on, on a une solide réputation, une solide habitude de, de, de travail, ce qui n'empêche pas qu'on évolue. Euh, il y a les fondamentaux du programme et puis les contenus évolutifs parce qu'on est sur un, un environnement euh, éminemment mouvant. Donc, on remet à jour euh, la liste de nos cours, les contenus euh, et les différents thèmes abordés. Euh, on a aujourd'hui plus de 2500 anciens de ce programme qui sont répartis sur les cinq continents, donc qui sont aussi euh, un levier important en termes de, de développement de carrière et qui s'intègrent bien évidemment dans le réseau euh, des diplômés ESSEC euh, qui compte aujourd'hui pas loin de 45 000 euh, anciens euh, au niveau international. On forme chaque année sur ce programme euh, environ 200 personnes, en, en moyenne 150 étudiants et une cinquantaine de participants, donc dans une logique, un programme qui est un peu différent dans son format, donc en part-time, euh, en format exécutif. Euh, on a plus d'une centaine de nos étudiants qui effectuent euh, tout ou partie de leur cursus sur notre campus de, de Singapour. Et on propose également, euh, au-delà des campus de Sergi et Singapour, des échanges internationaux euh, en Amérique du Nord, donc États-Unis et Canada, euh, et en Amérique latine. Donc ça, ce sont des choix par rapport à un, à un déploiement professionnel dans différentes régions du monde. On est euh, présent régulièrement depuis euh, maintenant plus d'une dizaine d'années dans les rankings internationaux, ce qui fait que c'est aussi un levier après en termes de, on va dire, de valeur ajoutée du diplôme euh, et de ré reconnaissance de la part des, des recruteurs. On travaille, et ça c'est vrai pour toutes les SEC, euh, on travaille sur des outils pédagogiques euh, qu'on espère et qu'on fait en sorte d'être innovant euh, sur la mobilité. Donc on a des plateformes euh, d'accès euh, au support de cours, aux cours euh, et à, à tout, toutes les informations liées à la, à la vie de nos programmes et à notre réseau, donc avec Google qui est notre partenaire, euh, ainsi qu'avec Apple et Cross Knowledge. Donc on, on, on évolue sur l'aspect euh, mobile de nos contenus. Euh, on, a, on donne accès à toute un, une série, de, de, au travers de cette plateforme MySec, donc qui est euh, gérée par Google, à tous nos outils de travail collaboratifs, à ESSEC TV, aux ressources documentaires en ligne que vous pouvez consulter, euh, euh, bien évidemment, à distance, toutes les, tous les plannings de cours, enfin, toutes les informations, on va dire, logistiques et quotidiennes qui sont euh, incluses, des modules de e-learning pour ceux qui veulent approfondir ou préparer leurs cours, et puis tous les supports de cours. Euh, et tous les échanges avec les professeurs qui peuvent se faire en, en ligne. Bien évidemment, on, on, le face-à-face -face avec l'humain euh, reste euh, très important. Questions-réponses, on va les garder euh, pour, pour la fin de cette intervention. Je vais passer le... I leave you the floor. Euh, voilà, et puis vous avez pour certains euh, peut-être aperçu, on a des étudiants qui sont sur le, le stand du SMIB, on a un ancien diplômé du part-time exécutif, donc voilà, et on est à votre disposition pour répondre à, à vos questions, vos questionnements, euh, l'éligibilité de votre projet, de votre profil euh, pour candidater à ce programme. Voilà. Donc Nicolas, Nicolas is teaching for, for the SMIB program already for four years, I think. Uh, entering the fourth year. Mm -hmm. So, well, Nicole, I don't. I, are you? <laughs> are you gi gonna give a, a little bit of your own background, or not? Quickly, can do this. Okay, very quickly, uh, Nicolas Graff, I'm Swiss, French-speaking Swiss. Uh, I've been uh, with ESSEC for about four and a half years now. Uh, before that, I was uh, in the United States with uh, the University of Houston and Rice University, which happened to be in the same city, Houston, Texas. Uh, before that, uh, still in the US at Virginia Tech. Uh, and then uh, before that, actually, I followed a, a, a training uh, to be, become a chef. So I'm a certified chef and ended up with a PhD in finance and strategy. Uh, so, you, you know, you, you never know where, where you, you end up. Uh, and I ended up at ESSEC, um, teaching in various programs. I'm, I'm responsible for the INI Institute of Hospitality Management, uh, and also teach in various other programs. Other than that, that you know, that's it. So if you, my, my mother tongue is French, so if you have questions in French, c'est parfait, allez-y. Uh, but I will, I will respond in English, okay, obviously. All right? Well, uh, I have been asked to actually, uh, I changed the title, because the title was, and I thought I can't handle the title uh, of, the, of, of the talk. Uh, the title was How to Build a Successful Global Strategy. Well, guess what? I have no idea because otherwise I wouldn't be here, right? I mean, seriously. 
so, so, so I figured, you know, let's be a little bit more realistic in what, what we want to achieve today. And I said, well, what, what are some of the keys to potentially, eventually, develop some successful global strategy? Uh, is that acceptable for you? So I don't give you the recipe like this. You know, even being a chef, I don't have a recipe for that. Uh, in fact, for strategy, there is no recipe to follow, right? As you will see, hopefully, strategy, a lot of it is, is about thinking as opposed to simply applying a recipe. Now, in the SMIB program, which uh, Sylvie hasn't mentioned because I'm, I'm more into the strategy side of the SMIB, obviously, you have different classes. One of them is about strategy in terms of the, how do you think strategically? How do you take problems uh, and identify what the challenges are, identify what the alternatives are, identify what, what kind of solutions you would like to implement. So this is more of a, of a, of a you know, kind of a, 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 let's say, cognitive side of strategy. And you have another one which is more about the practical side, which is a toolbox. So there's another class which is about strategy toolbox, the, the tools, uh, frameworks that consultants typically apply or, or people inside companies actually apply to, to develop their, their strategic plans. Uh, so today I thought more about thinking strategically about global, uh, global strategy. And I, I decided to ask you a first question, if that thing works. How do you make technology work? All right. What do, what do you know about strategy? I mean, why do companies, why do they need a strategy in the first place? And I, I tend to ask questions in the classroom. So to give you a real feel of how it feels, I'm going to ask you questions today. What, what is what is the key reason for having a strategy for a company? Profit. Profit is the objective. It's not necessarily the reason, unless you're really a damn capitalist. You know, like 100%, your blood is capitalist. But it's the objective because you need to make a profit to survive and obviously to satisfy shareholders and so forth and so forth. But some companies have other, let's say, reasons, raison d'être, as we say in French. Sustainable development, I hear bits and pieces of things I'd like to hear, but not the whole. Have a solid position in that environment. Okay, okay, there's a question, you see, I mean, I give you hints. You see, the environment, and I'm not talking about the weather. All right? Well, there is a competitive component to strategy. Obviously, there are some competitive uh, uh, elements because you, you know, obviously, uh, the, the, not everybody can be the winner. Uh, and that's true in a, in a, in a marketplace. Yes? Mm, to be able to adapt to any future environment. Right, right. There is an adaptation notion, and I'd and I like to, to get on that. Did you get a copy of my slides? No. <laughs> Jeez. All right, so do you, you know that person? Yeah. Who's that? Not, not the actress, not... This is the Red Queen. Look, she looks like a queen, and she has red hair. She's the Red Queen. And... Uh, there's a story, you know the Red Queen from Alice in Wonderland? Yes, what's the story about the Red Queen and Alice? At one point, Alice wants to, she wants to escape, right? And as she tries to escape, actually the Red Queen may, you know, says something and she says, now here you see, it takes all, all the running you can do to keep in the same place. And in fact, in the movie, because in the book it's, diffi it's difficult to see, right? I mean, it's easy to read, but it's difficult to see the, the scene. But in the, in, in the movie, you see Alice running and running and running. She stays in the same place. Why is this? Because the environment moves as well, right? And just to keep up in the same position, you need to run very often. And this is very true for companies as well. This is part of the Red Queen hypothesis. It's, it's part of the uh, evolutionary uh, theory of things. You know, you need to actually move and adapt and adjust to simply survive in a moving environment. This is true for species. This is true for very, very uh, most entities we can think of in the world. So there is a notion of having to move, constantly move. And strategy, part of it is actually to, to, to know how to move and try to adapt, right? Very important. What's that? You don't know that story? But yeah, frogs. Thank you very much. You know, you, you passed the eye test, so that's good. No, the frogs take too long to realize that the water is too... Is that there? Okay. Before jumping. You know, there's a very important thing in management, which is called storytelling. Sorry. So that you can bullshit the way you want, and it works. <laughs> so storytelling, yes, you're right, but let's, you know, 
tell the story. The story is, and I, and I, and I you know, I tend to, to make the stories mine. This is a well-known story. I didn't invent it. But as, as you know, I like cooking. And, and one of the things that you like to do when you cook, how many of you are French? How many are British? British. English. OK, so there will be a fight. But <laughs> in France, some people like frog legs, right? And, and as, a, as a certified chef, I always try to improve my recipes. And I've tried to actually cook frog legs the best way I could. And so the first thing I did is typically you know, I bring water to a boil. And once it's boiling, I take the frog. Obviously, I cut the leg before. No, I don't. I don't, actually. I take the frog whole, throw in the water, in the boiling water. And what happens? If you throw a, 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 a frog alive in a boiling water pan, what happens? It jumps out. Yes. It, and and it, it, it's hurt, right? But it, it leaves. And if you want to eat the frog legs, then you, you know, it's too bad. You can't, right? Because the frog leaves. Now, what happens if you take the frog and you, you, you put it in the water, water at you know, room temperature, and you slowly simmer, bring it to a boil, the water with the, the frog inside, what happens? That's the part of the story you missed. Yes, it stays up until up until it's too late and yes, death. Right? And then obviously in the plate. So what's the takeaway from that story? If you think about this as strategy here of, of being part, part of strategy is to ensure that the company can actually continue to survive in a moving environment by adjusting and adopting its strategic moves. That's the first takeaway from the first story. What's the second takeaway from the second story? You have to make the strategy to move up and uh, That was the first story. You have to see longer and on farther than just the close. That could be part of a third story, but not my point with the second one. Okay, okay, wait, okay. The second uh, takeaway for, for, from the second story is we typically, us, human, uh, as well as, so individuals as well as, as corporations, tend to actually uh, uh, realize brutal changes much faster and much more easily than, than slow and subtle changes in the environment in which we live. When changes is subtle, slow, we don't really realize up until often it's too late. While when you have a brutal change in the environment, then you, everybody realizes that there's a brutal change. And so one of the challenging strategies to be capable of detecting you know, subtle signals of environmental changes so that, the, the, so that you can actually plan a little ahead of others. Very, very important takeaway in terms of strategy. So that being said, I want to move on with what strategy is. And I think this is a, a good definition. I mean, you can Google uh, you know, strategy definition and, and end up with more pages than if you Google something on you know, porn business. But, there's a lot of definitions of strategy. This one is, a, is one that I, that I like. Uh, from Jay Barney, he says, strategy is a pattern of resource allocation that enables firms to maintain or improve their performance. The only thing I would add is in a moving environment, right? So it's about allocating a pattern of resource allocation. So it's not individual allocation of resources. It's a pattern of resource allocation. How do we establish an organization to actually continuously allocate its resources to ensure that it adapts, adjusts to a moving environment in order to survive and you know, hopefully perform better than others. This is really what strategy is all about. And the key is really it's a moving environment, moving environment. So I've been asked to talk about global strategy. What, what's the big thing about global and, or globalization? How do you see that? What's globalization for you? Because obviously, if we talk about global strategy, somehow it's because we've, we've gone through a phase of certain phase of globalization, and we continue to, to, to be in a certain phase of globalization. What, what is it for you, globalization? Availability of information. Say that louder. Availability of information. No, that's information availability. It's not. I mean, Part of exchange, but the, the reality of globalization, if you truly look at the facts, one of the major elements to it is trade. This is really what globalization is mostly about. It's about trade. It's globalization of trade, trade, commerce. 
exchange of product, services, goods, capital, right? This is what, what globalization is really all about when you look at the facts. Not at the perception we have of it, but at the facts. Uh, and here, what you see, because if you look at sharing of information, I'm sorry, but if you look at the map of information sharing and information flow on the internet, for instance, you see that it's not global. It's actually regional for the most part, right? It's not global. What's truly global is, is the trade exchange. And here in that chart, if you just look at this, you see that the, the orange line here represents as it's an index, right? Index with the base year in 1960 and how it evolved relative to 1960 in volume here for the world merchandise trade, international trade versus the world GDP in blue. So my first, when I, when I came across that chart, that figure, it really came very clear that, that the, the key to, to, to what we have discussed as the movement of globalization has been that increase in the global trade. It's part of most of the growth in GDP worldwide, right? So it's really about trade, globalization of trade. But, and if we really look at the facts, there's not many other things that are being globalized. I mean, yes, people move a bit more, but in fact-based says that this is not the key element to globalization. The key element is the globalization of trade. So my question then is, is globalization, because we need to talk about that before we talk about global strategy, right? Globalization, what does it mean? Does it mean that it's only about interdependencies, things being interdependent of each other, just like that? You see, this is the, the links, the relationships between financial institutions worldwide. The ones in red are uh, uh, European financial institutions, banks. In blue, you have the US or North American ones. Uh, and in, in green, you have the uh, Asian, uh, mostly Jap Japanese uh, financial institutions. And you see all of their relationships, business relationships. It's a web of trade. This is mostly trade when you think about it, right? So is it only about interdependencies when we talk about globalization or is it simply that they're all becoming the same or all becoming one, like unified, right? Because it means different things to strategy if you think about globalization as being just a global marketplace of exchange or if it means being all the same no difference, or if it means being only unified. It's different, different interpretation of globalization, right? This is another interesting thing. When a lot of people talk about globalization, they think that globalization means we all kind of, kind of become one. We all look the same. Nationalities become less relevant in a globalized world, right? We hear that very frequently. Have you heard that in the past? Nationalities becomes less important. Yes? Well, in fact, fact-based, it's, it's wrong. Nations are increasingly different from one another. Increasingly. Why? Because they each specialize in that global trade. They each specialize. And the two charts I'm going to show you are proof, based on facts, that nations are very different. And I took two nations, United States and Germany, right? Which when you look at the two, you know, they eat burgers, they, you know, <laughs> they drive German cars, they, you know. But they each have decided to specialize in different ways. And their differences are here, if we take uh, an example of patent specialization by technology classes, right? So they looked at the changes between, so uh, over time, in fact, uh, and, and for certain periods, the net increases or decreases in patents uh, being, uh, uh, let's say, developed uh, for each technology classes. Negative changes, so when you go on the left side, these are negative changes, means there's an increasingly less uh, emphasis on that kind of technology class. And when you see on the right side, that it's moving on the right side, it means that there is an increase emphasized on this kind of technology, uh, technology class, right? And if you look at that, you see clearly here, I take a few examples. Uh, Weapons, United States has actually decreased its specializations on the manufacturing of weapons and, and development of weapons. Uh, if you take uh, uh, engines, right, has decreased its, its emphasis on engines uh, creations. Agricultural machines also decreased. However, obviously, if you look at information technology, they've increased their specialization on that, right? Now, take a deep breath, because I'm going to show you something dramatic. Germany. 
do you see? Look, I can go back. You see, it's like a mirror, right? I can do that several times, I mean. <laughs> this is the reverse. So two countries that have become increasingly different in, a global, in an increasingly globalized world. It's an interesting concept, no? Specialization is, in fact, some, one of the consequences of globalization, as opposed to being all of the same. Now, obviously, this is not true for every, uh, let's say, component of the, the, the environment. Some components of the environment have been unified. Some have been, let's say, become, they've all become one. And other components of the, uh, of the environment have become highly specialized. And this is the trick in understanding globalization. This is the trick, right? And we will see, I have a very quick case study to talk about to show that when the endowment or specialization by country has, uh, while that has increased, countries have become increasingly specialized on a few sets of activities that are different from the specialization of other countries and other nations. Some other elements have become totally unified and this has become major challenges to succeed globally for corporations. And I will show you that a case study in a minute. So what's global then? And here you have three examples of the way some of these companies have decided to define somehow global. And it's a bit simplified, but some of these companies. So do you, rec do you recognize this company? The name is in it. Nestle. Yes, Nestle. Uh, Nestle means, for them, global me means two things. I'm using their, their image for one, essentially, because it means to them being everywhere. It means being everywhere. It means there are markets everywhere, and it's a, tra it's a matter of trade. Trading and, and they trade everywhere. If you if you come if you come from any nation on earth, you probably have had the chance to to buy and purchase and eat one of Nestle products, right? Uh, last time I visited Nestle headquarters in Vevey, Switzerland, uh, I've asked them if they have an inventory of all of the products they have worldwide, and they told me no. We don't even know how many products we have worldwide. We just can't keep track of all of the products that are developed by the various uh, divisions of Nestle simply because they have too many, right? Um, I was skeptical about that, but you know, that's what they told me. Uh, so th to, th to them, it means being everywhere. For another company that you can identify here, who, what that company? <laughs> McDonald's high quality burgers, and I truly mean that. It's not a joke. Uh, it, global being mean, uh, means somehow being universal. I know it's a bit of a stretch because last time I went to Germany, you know, you have different menu items in the McDonald's. In France, we know that we have the Mac Baguette and all of these kind of things. But if you, if you look at, at the numbers, in fact, most of their best-selling items remain the same globally. So to them, it's the same. It's kind of being universal. We are a universal brand and with universal products. Different way of looking at things. For IBM, being global means being totally unified, being one. We are the integrator. We are the, the world integrator. We integrate the various components that exist out there in the various countries, various things, etc., etc. So we, globalization means being capable of integrating everything that's on Earth. Now, Nestle has used IBM to also integrate some of its, some of its activities um, through the globe, the globe project that they launched. But different ways to look at what's global, and obviously, depending on the way you see what's global in the changing environment, obviously, you want to design different strategies, right? That's right. I mean, if you want to be universal, obviously, you're not going to do too much of, uh, uh, you know, localization of your, what it is that you do. If you say, well, no, it's being everywhere, then what you want to do, you want to be everywhere. You're going to attract and, and, and attack each and every market that you see out there with potentially different products. So it doesn't mean being universal, right? And if you say it's being unified, well, what you're going to do is you're going to try to actually take advantage of the fact that you're in a in number of different places to actually unify all of your processes uh, and activities different ways to look at, at global strategies. Now, just to give you a few now, uh, let's say, ways or, or tools to think about the case study I will be using uh, in a minute. Uh, here is a, a way people look at, at global strategies, levers on, on how to define a global strategy. Uh, so you have various dimensions, starting from market participation, product offering, location of value chain, marketing focus, and competitive moves. And here you have the two extremes if you want, in the choices that, that exist out there. In a, a multi-domestic strategy uh, kind of uh, approach, market participation is opportunistic as opposed to a global strategy orientation where 
market participation is where people actually target significant market shares uh, in, in the major markets, right? So different ways, you either look at globalization in saying, well, I simply go wherever market is opening, opportunistically. Or you decide on a global strategy in saying, no, I want to be one of the largest players in most of the largest markets, as opposed to go to everywhere you could. Different ways of looking at it. Product offering for multi-domestic uh, strategy, typically it's locally adapted, one in opposition to a global strategy where it's generally mostly standardized worldwide. Right? You have the two extremes. Uh, location of value chain it generally is mostly to fully local. The value chain means all of the activities that add value uh, in, the, in, in the company or in this, uh, at least within the boundaries of the, of the company. While global strategy is typically concentrated and specialized in various countries, try to take advantage of, of uh, na national uh, advantages uh, and specialization, and then you uh, uh, reassemble everything and sell that in a global, in a global way. Marketing focus, again, local for multi-domestic strategy, uniform worldwide, and competitive moves is done by country. So you have a uh, uh, business level strategy per country as opposed to a global strategy where it's integrated globally. It is not easy for any company in any industry, it is not easy to know where to place the cursor, where to go, where to place the emphasis of the strategy, right? Uh, and we'll see, we'll see why. Another way to look at essentially the same thing in a more synthetic way though, is to look at it on that uh, matrix here, where you have two axes, global integration versus local responsiveness. It's global integration from high to low and high to low. You have different ways of looking at it. I want to be highly integrated globally. What that would mean is I take advantage of national or lo locational advantages due to their specialization, right? Uh, and I integrate all of my value chain at the global level, right? I produce, uh, let's say, I produce a certain type of, of product in a certain given country because that country is specialized in cheap labor. Then I produce, maybe I develop my uh, new innovation, my new technology in, in another country because that country has specialized in uh, whatever R&D type of, of activity, right? So you, you take advantage of local specialization and then you globally integrate all of these to actually sell an entire product. Apple would be a good example of that, right? So, but, and they have absolutely no, or at least a very low local responsiveness, right? How many of you have an iPhone? So your iPhone is from Japan? Yes. Yes, your iPhone is from? You don't have one? No. Where would it be from? Where would it be from? Where would you, um, if you want to buy a, an iPhone, which country? Asia, but I don't know. No, I, okay, okay, Sorry. she's not trying to help me here. Where did you buy your, it's an iPhone? Where did you buy it? In France. In France, okay. Can we see if they look the same? Yeah. I can see through the, don't worry, I have, I have x-ray eyes. Sorry, guys. Uh, I can see, it's the same, it's the same. I can bet, I bet my paycheck. It's the same. I'm taped, so I'm pretty much sure about that. It's the same. <laughs> I won. It's the same. So they take advantage, they manufacture, they research, they do all of these different things on lo based upon locations, locational advantage, if you want, and specialization, and then they globally integrate the whole thing, right? And this is true for their apps, this is true for a number of things that they do. On the contrary, you have the other opposite, you know, it's, it, it would be a little stupid from a strategic standpoint to be in that zone where you have low integration and low responsiveness. That would be very French. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, except for the luxury good industry. Uh, anyway, uh, but you typically have companies struggling in that one or in this one. Very hard to achieve this one up there. Uh, but this one here is very also another one, typical one, where you are high local responsiveness, but the trade-off is fairly low global integration, right? And there you could, you could imagine, uh, let's say, when I talked about Nestle, I think Nestle has, has, has still a little integration, but Nestle manufactures its products relatively close to where they sell their products, relatively close. 
One of the reasons is their products do not add enough value to compensate for transportation costs in many ways, and they are not sufficient, let's say, uh, 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 advantages of producing in one country as opposed to another one. So they typically have a higher, greater local responsiveness than, than, than Apple, for instance, right? But as a consequence, they tend to be a little bit less globally integrated. Okay, so two, two, also two different ways of looking at global, global strategies. All right, decided to look at the case. Uh, I know these master classes are usually designed to show you how we typically uh, manage a classroom at ESSEC. Generally, we manage a classroom with much more uh, interaction, except that we ask the student to prepare beforehand. So as I haven't been able to ask you to prepare anything, I'm gonna do the work for you. So decided to look at Philips. Philips and Matsushita, or called Panasonic today, right? There's a very nice case study about these two companies, which I regularly use in my class, and I'm going to change that in the, in, the, in the next one. It's a very nice case study because it looks at companies that have been around for close to 100 years, and they have been competing to some extent for over 60 or 70 years globally, right? Panasonic and Philips. Both companies had obviously great international success, yet they had totally different uh, uh, capabilities and also totally different global strategies. At the moment as we speak, both are still a little bit struggling in the environment in which we live, although Philips has done a little better um, in, the, in the recent years than, than uh, Panasonic. But Panasonic uh, has, has been more successful, let's say, over the past 20 years than Philips has. Okay? And there are some reasons for it. And we're going to look into these reasons. They still are somehow struggling, let's say because we are in a changing world, globalization of, of different things, uh, as I said, and they potentially haven't fully grasped the environment in which they live, or, and they have very uh, strong difficulties in moving their environment together with the, uh, we, we, their organization together with the environment, right? So let's have a look. Philips and its environment. So I've looked at the timeline here. It's always interesting to look at evolution to, 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 to understand why a company has been successful, why it hasn't. It's great learning, actually, to not to replicate necessarily, but to understand relationships between an environment and a company. So if we start with Philips, which started before uh, in 1890 something, I, if I recall correctly, uh, Philips started to internationalize because Philips is, was born in the Netherlands, right? Anyone from the Netherlands? Any Dutch national here? It's a fairly relatively small country, right? Nothing wrong with it. You know, Switzerland is a great country, but the problem is being small, the market is fairly small, right? So Philips uh, had very early in its, in its development found that it, its market, its domestic market was, was kind of too small. So they had to, inter to internationalize quite quickly. And what they started to do is to internationalize in the 90s, early 1900, uh, 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 I think it was 1910 or something like this. And Philips at the time was actually producing essentially light bulbs, right? They created light bulbs and they had two uh, founders in the company. One was an engineer and the other one was a salesperson. And they each uh, were actually uh, competing with each other. The engineer saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invent products, so many new products that you, you won't be able to sell them. And the sales guy was saying, well, I'm going to sell so many products that you won't be able to come up with new products, right? So they were competing with each other. That's, that's the kind of story. Now, obviously, later on, Great Depression in the 30s with beginning of high trade barriers between countries, right? So countries, because of that huge recession back then, started to protect themselves. Protectionism, we're, we're, we're hearing some of that now, right? And with these high trade barriers, uh, there was a kind of a, not really the same environment as the global, globalized environment we talked about a few minutes ago. So what Philips did is they started to produce locally. So they had a multi-domestic strategy, right? Multi-domestic strategy. They started to locate some of their productions in the international markets because of high trade barriers and tariffs, right? Which would, would make exports difficult or costly, and also because of political pressure, right? If you want to sell in my country, you need to produce in my country because then you provide jobs. So Philip started to do it this way. And as they continued to evolve in that environment, they were quite successful because each of these national markets were fairly fragmented, or they were truly different from one another. Not in the sense of they were specialized, 
but they were different in the sense that they had different standards, technological standards. The light bulbs you could use in the Netherlands was, were not the same technology than the light bulbs, bulbs you could use in Germany. They were not. So if you would buy a, a light bulb in, in the Netherlands, you could not plug it in Germany and have it work. Why? Because the standards were different. Right? There were no international standard at the time. And so Philips was pretty successful, and they started to give increasing power to their national organization. NOs means national organizations. And they had national organizations that were driving R&D and that were driving also uh, product development, not only in terms of R&D, but also sales, right? Why? Because each of the countries were very different from a standard standpoint. If you recall TV sets, for those of you who are old enough, you couldn't use, I mean, if you were to move between Switzerland and France, right, you couldn't use the same TV set because the standard was not the same. That has been fixed, right? I know. At the beginning of the cell phone, well, cell phone, yes, it was cell phones. Uh, you could not use your cell phones globally unless you had satellite cell phone, right? Now, you pay a lot, but you can use it, obviously, right? But you could not because the standards were different. Hence, Philips developed a strategy of multi-domestic strategy, producing, driving R&D in various countries. Now, in the 70s, beginning of the European common market, was a major driver of, of globalization together with other trade agreements and with other standardization of products. And not surprising, Philips profit started to fall up and, and, and Philips started to begin a wave of completely unsuccessful reorganization for the next 25 years. And that was the result of standardization of markets and of products from a technology standpoint. Looking at Panasonic, and I have to somehow simplify due to time constraints. Panasonic, same timeline. To look at this, Panasonic was founded back then, in, uh, a little later than, than, than uh, Philips, uh, with the founder having developed a 125-year strategic plan. Right? And think about it, a 125-year strategic plan. Uh, which worked quite well for at least 85 years. Um, so what they, they, they started to do is Panasonic in Japan, very domestic company at the beginning, and they started to actually dominate the markets, domestic markets, uh, so much that they had to, to continue to grow. They had to actually go internationally. After the <coughs> depression, that's when they started to first diversify their products in their domestic country. And they soon started, this is the same timeline on the top, right, same timeline. But they started to, as, as they started to dominate their domestic market, they started to develop an export business. Very different than what Philips did, because they didn't start to produce outside. They were still producing, doing their R&D and everything at home domestically, and only exporting their goods, shipping them to other countries, right? Very different approach, obviously. And guess what? With the beginning of that European common market, standardization of technologies, well, that's actually when Panasonic uh, started to develop a few factories abroad, but only due to political uh, pressure. And they started to take the lead and see their profit actually increase dramatically when Philips' profit started to decline dramatically at that, that exact time. Essentially, the same industry. So what explained that was the multiplication of trade agreements and of international standardization. Panasonic experienced its first loss later in the 1995s, 2000, late 90s, early 2000s. And that's, they started to struggle just like Philips was, was struggling. What happened in 2000? Give me something that happened in 2000, 2001. Don't tell me September 11th, because yes, it happened, but it also happened in 2002. The day, I'm saying. The day also happened. What happened? the year 2000, other than September 11th. Say that louder. The what? The bug. No, yeah, there is no bug. Come on. Well, that was a dot-com crisis, right? The first bubble, a tech bubble. But yes, that was due. I mean, if you think about the tech bubble, it's because there was rapid innovation in technology, right? New technology was coming all the time and people were adopting new technology, but potentially it was changing so fast that none of this company was capable of actually 
uh, getting a true return on the initial investments, hence the bubble, right? Because of the, the rapidity, the, the, the frequency of, of change in that technology. And that's when Panasonic really started to struggle, and Philips also started to struggle. So when you look at that case, so that's exactly what you, you probably have my slides as well, proliferation of disruptive technologies in the environment. And so when you look at that, you can somehow look at their history, and, and, and this is a kind of a synthesis of the way Philips has evolved. So they have multiple high-intensity R&D centers scattered all around the world, Philips. Why all around the world? Because they were historically designed to be capable of meeting different domestic or different uh, national needs from a standard standpoint. And they were high intensity in the sense that they always had the, that drive of being very creative and innovative. Why? Because they had a lot of different markets. They had very strong national organization controlling product development, product and distribution. Why? Because of that market fragmentation at the time. Weak product division, the, the, the product division were quite weak. They were driven by the national organization mostly. So it's the national organization that we're deciding in France, Philips, you need to do that. It's not the product division that, that had to do that. If we simplify also the history of Panasonic, very highly centralized, low intensity R&D, with an R&D that was not coming up with new product all of the time, they were coming with a few ones, and then they were mass producing them. Highly centralized and highly productive, uh, high productivity production centers, still mo for most of them in Japan, some of them abroad, and local distribution, but totally centrally controlled. So obviously two clearly different global strategies, one's driven, one essentially emphasizing expert with a centralized organization and another one uh, actually looking at a multi-domestic multi kind of approach. This is an example of the evolution of standards that I was, I was referring to, the standards for Wi-Fi. So if you look at 2G, do you remember 2G networks? It must, must, must be, uh, you know, kind of fascinating for people from Japan, but in Europe we still have some places that have 2G. 2G networks or, or standards for Wi-Fi technology were different between the US, Japan, the world, right? Some of them were, were the same. 2.5G, which I've never heard of, personally, so let's skip it, right? No, I still know Edge and other things like this. They started to become more common across markets. And now what we see is essentially that they're global. We have unified global standards for Wi-Fi technology. This was a significant change, as we, we, we talked about, especially for Philips, which was at the disadvantage of Philips, yet at the advantage of Panasonic, right? Disadvantage for Philips, because Philips had, if we look at that, an organization that was essentially driven by high responsiveness to the local needs because when it was initially, originally organized, they decided on a multi-domestic strategy because markets were fragmented at the technology standard level. While Panasonic was actually global integration, they struggled for a little while because markets were fragmented and also because there was no true specialization between countries at the time. But then they started to strive as technology standardized and as markets started to specialize. And they were in a country where they could actually be highly productive and export abroad a technology that was essentially the same, right? So two examples of companies that have not been able truly have adopted some global strategies have succeeded at some times, but have been unable to actually cope with the changing environment. And today, both, as I said, are struggling. Philips has reorganized dramatically and is doing a little better. And they both, in their global strategy, are trying to move there, right? Why is this? Why is it in today's world that global strategies are probably better off when they are somehow an attempt of global integration and local responsiveness? Why is this? What's the big challenge today in competing globally in these two industries? <coughs> to know all the time uh, what it happens uh, in the world and uh, to listen uh, and uh, see uh, all the trends. So that's the local responsiveness, 
right? So if I understand your answer is you need to be local responsive or locally responsive because you need to be capable of grasping market changes quickly, local market changes quickly. I agree with that. I agree with that. The world is changing very fast and you never know where it's coming first. So you need to have antennas to actually be capable of paying attention to this change and, and these antennas need to be somehow local. So then the question becomes why do you need to be still globally integrated? Obviously to optimize your cost, but why is it important to optimize your cost to be globally integrated? I, I, I know you, you answer, answer the question, but... To take advantage of the Yes, yes, absolutely. To take advantage of that local or, or national specialization phenomena that we have seen. And this is a true struggle for organizations today on the global stage. Because you need to be both locally responsive and globally integrated. And this is a significant challenge in the way you organize and decide on the pattern of resource allocation that you want to achieve, right? Because markets are changing very quickly, so you need to be quick on your feet, yet at the same time you need to be capable of globally integrating things. And they tend to be uh, kind of, you know, very difficult to put together these two things. And to me, the real challenge of the 21st century global strategy, uh, challenge if you want, the 21st strategy is to achieve that kind of integration and of local responsiveness. Some companies are achieving it, some others are struggling. The ones that are achieving it on a global scale, I would say McDonald's has been able to actually achieve it quite well. Others that are struggling, for instance, I would say uh, another example would be Starbucks has been struggling. They have tried, but they have failed in terms of, of growth, right? Walmart has succeeded for a certain period of time and is now kind of failing, right? Because they, they realize it's very difficult to do these two things. And so some of the keys to global, successful global strategies are about finding the, that balance here of global integration and local responsiveness. And if you can find that recipe for success, telling you you're gonna be very successful in the SMIP program, very successful. So, I'm done. Any question? Have I killed you? <laughs> Feel free to ask questions in French, English, on this, which is obviously a very uh, simplified case, obviously. Uh, I usually treat them with in much more depth and details, but in 40 minutes it's very difficult. Uh, any question on this or any question on the program, on the Smith program, French or English? We'd be happy to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, the technology helps it because there is a frame that is common everywhere in the world, but then they enable local people to develop local application in local language or uh, local needs. So in, in a way, I see... Uh, yes, but because, because you're outsourcing the ones that are causing problems. The ones that, what you're saying is a good, it's a good point. There are some people that are trying to, to, to create a global ecosystem, right? which can uh, uh, also accommodate local needs. But if you, if you know Android or all of these platforms, even Facebook or others or Google, they have the global ecosystem, but they are not the one feeding the local content. Because feeding the local content at a profit is challenging. So what they do is they create the ecosystem, they try to, to keep people inside it, but then they say, okay, hey, I let you do the nitty gritty, you know, the tough job of being locally responsive. So to me, they are not locally responsive. They have made others make them feel they're locally responsive. And that's why that some of them succeed. And this is a challenge for me for Google, for instance. If, if other people are not playing the game, then how will they be capable of being locally responsive? Right? They're using other people to actually do the work of feeding the content on a local basis, and they just provide the global integrated ecosystem. But it's, to them, it will be a challenge, I think. Questions? Well, if you want to learn more about these kind of stuff, well, you know, you know where to find me, Sylvie? No questions from my No, but if you want to take over and say something. Well, thank you very much, Nicolas. Thank you. Thank you.